to my paradise. All right, shifters, thank you very much for joining us once again. My name is Don Aiti. I am the uh, editorial assistant here at Shifter Magazine. And today uh, we are diving straight into the UK with uh, an artist that I've discovered uh, fairly recently. But as soon as I got into his music, I just I was in awe of uh, both his talent, but uh, his way of words and uh, his musical, well, just his musical prowess in, gen in general. Uh, ladies and, gen and gentlemen, the one and only Sentinel the Saint. Thank you very much for... Uh, Time. <laughs> let's go, let's go. <laughs> Thank you very much for making the time, man. So, um, new album coming out uh, this week, Beautiful Disaster. Before we get in, yeah. before you get into it, this is a very busy week for you right now, the time that we're recording this interview. How do you feel? I feel good. Yeah. Um, busy, you know, album's out, album's out very soon. So, um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know. People... Yeah. People who know me know that you know I, I'm I'm a happy guy. I smile a lot and I'm cool, this, despite how my music sounds. But um, I'm always super chilled. So you know we're here. I'm looking forward to ask you about that because actually, uh, let's dive in. Well, before we even dive into that, actually, um, I do want to ask about you uh, for our Canadian audience, the people who. Um, or who might just be discovering you or who are looking forward to discovering you even more uh, when your album comes out. Um, how did, who is Sentinel the Saint? Like, where did you grow up? Where about are you from? Like, what's what's your origin story? My, the origin story of the Saint. Well, <laughs> I am um, mixed um, English and Caribbean. My mom is from Jamaica, born and raised, and came over to England when she was 18. My dad is... English, Irish, mixed. Um, and I grew up in South London. Um, normal normal South London school between my mum and my dad who are separated, but they're really good friends. Dad's a musician, producer in a hip hop group. Um, my mum was a hairdresser and does a bunch of things. Uh, and up pop Santino the same. <laughs> All right. <laughs> From young. It, exactly. Well, to, to, to go forward in that direction, like I, what? how did you discover music or how did music discover you? Well, my earliest exposures of music was through both of my parents, but um, my dad, uh, as I said, is a producer and plays those instruments. So I was always around him and around a lot of other artists, uh, well, musicians, uh, not artists, uh, well, both, but you know what I mean, musicians, people who played instruments and, and stuff like that. Um, and I had early exposure to a lot of the stuff he was working on. And really my earliest memories of uh, uh, all of just being around and hearing and playing music. I started playing piano at like, actually violin around nine, 10, and then like piano around 10, 11, started writing songs really young, picked up the guitar around 11, 12, like kind of always just been in it. Um, and I kind of grew up listening to my dad play. Okay, cool. And how much, so in now, I mean, you, you've blown up. I mean, you, you're, you're doing amazing yeah. things. Um, so, so you're a music, so you're a musician. Do you, you, you write your own song? You compose your own music? Everything. I, I, I'm a, I'm a musician, singer, songwriter, producer, everything, mostly before this album, I all produced actually like 90% of all the songs I've released. Um, and I spend most of my time writing and producing my own stuff, whether that's, you know, for fun or for my songs. I then, when I go into album mode, I tend to, or I'm now tending to go in with a bunch of producers and other musicians and kind of collaborating with them on this vision and this baby that I've nurtured, you know, for so long and then being like, I want to take it here. I want to do this. I want to do that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And, and, and how did you end up discovering the sound that you're going for? Because I'm going to be honest before we, uh, I discovered you, um, when I discovered your song, it, it brought a lot of melancholy, melancholy from, from in me, you know what I mean? And also um, I, f I find that your music, it's like it's like therapy for people who have dark emotions to process. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Now, how like how did that come about? Like your how much of your life goes into this music, or if it's not actually your life, like where do you find the inspiration yeah. for specifically for that kind of sound? It's all a lie. No, I'm joking, it's not. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. It's all fake. <laughs> um, no, I. I my dad grew up playing a lot of jazz and hip hop. My mom listened to a lot of R&B and reggae. And I think I got to the age about 16 where I was going through my rebellious phase as you do as a young boy specifically. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to find something that no one else liked or listened to. And that's kind of when I first found rock music. 
where a lot of my peers weren't into it and my family wasn't into it. And that for me was like what made me want to become like a guitar hero, you know, as well as growing up on a lot of Jimi Hendrix. Um, and then simultaneously, I found actually a lot of early weekend and party next door. And what they were saying for me and the mood of what they were saying was what really hit me. And yeah. a lot of the emotion I resonated with. Um, and I think, you know, I'm just like for a happy dude, I'm a dark emotional dude as much as much as, you know, like and I'm, I'm super interested in the darker sides and, you know, the harder sides and the more confusing sides of, of love and romance and storytelling, um, because that's what I find interesting, you know? So I've always, I've always been a writer. Like I wrote loads of poems when I was young and I've always wanted to tell those type of stories over fairy tale endings and lovey dovey stuff. Cause that doesn't hit me in my feels. So yeah. combining those things kind of made me, made me who I am really, as well as then, you know, um, a lot of personal, personal life things and, and relationships but I find that it's funny because they kind of go hand in hand like the way you view the world as well as the music you listen to and then what you end up expecting from romance and love and how you view it is, is end up ends up being how you look for it and how you treat it you know mm -hmm. in a dark and solemn way if that's what your thing is or in whatever way you know so I think they're hand in hand. That's very interesting because it is a it is a true perspective that you know we often um, for example, I know for me, what defined love was the kind of music that I listened to. And then I went on and experienced love um, in many ways, all the complex, all, all the what love and all these complexities and different shades yeah, yeah. of emotions and whatnot. And I found myself um, relating to love completely different when you were saying like that lovey dovey things or whatever. Like, it's not that the beauty of it, does, not that I don't relate to the beauty of it, but it doesn't feel as real. Whereas you're yeah. going for something that for some reason is even more relatable. Why do you think your audience relates to your music so much? Because I think we as people find it easier to relate to the sadness and pain. I think it's without getting too uh, philosophical. Um, and I'm sitting in a dark room oh, right oh, now. Oh, so. oh, we can, oh, we can. I mean, we're, we're both <laughs> vibing and, you know. Well, yeah, let's, I just think, I think part of the human condition as, as, as how we are as people and things is a lot to do with, with um, you know, everyone, everyone says it, a lot of old philosophers say it, but it's a lot to do with like, like suffering and sadness. And, uh, and I think that there's a certain attachment that humans have to those things and those type of feelings more to the feelings of happiness. And I, I, that's why I think everyone, everyone hears a sad song, no matter what movie they're in, and they're going to sing the lyrics along. Yeah. And some of these questions can't be explained, but there's a feeling, you know, that, that sadness provokes and, and relates to certain emotions, which which sometimes happiness doesn't always do. Do you find that people, even if they haven't related to that happiness that they want to, or, or, or for the people who only relate to the happy side of love, but who sort of like hear the, uh, the darkest part of it, do you find that there's a desire to relate to it, whether or not, because for some reason, you sort, of, you sort of find a way to, you paint it in very dark colors, but you find a way to make it so artistic and, you know what I mean? And, and, and like presentable and like uh, relatable and yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's a combination of being able to write songs in a certain way. You know, I think it's I think it's being able to to understand your audience. I think it's a difference between as well type of music you make because if I was making experimental, a lot more experimental and kind of off the off the kind of straight line of what current music is which I have a lot of songs that are, but I don't always put them out. They would, they might be less accessible to a lot of people because, you know, we hear in certain formats, we hear in certain melodies and certain chords and, mm -hmm. and certain structures and songs. And sometimes when we hear something that's not the normal structure we hear, it's a bit like, oh, what's going on? Like I had an interesting conversation with my dad the other day about how um, I used to be able to listen to loads of jazz music and get it. And the more I've gotten older and I've listened to like more trap stuff and hip hop stuff, um, I find it harder to understand jazz sometimes. And I think it's because it's certain forms of the music that I'm now used to listening to. And really I want to combine like deep musicality and lyricism and story writing in a form that is relatable and people can understand, but ultimately is just um, emotive and thought provoking. That's really, that's really that. Where I want to be. Beautiful, which sort of leads into my next question in regards to Beautiful Disaster. How is that conceptualized and um, 
what was the feeling like, you know, just of working on that on that project? And, you know, discover, did you discover different parts of yourself going to this? Did you uh, revisit all parts of yourself? Like your creative thoughts and process throughout this cre the creation of Beautiful Disaster. What was that like too? Yeah, uh, I think it's funny you said um, revisiting all parts of yourself. For me, like with this album, I was, I was very like, I was creating something really true to me, even through the, the mix of, obviously, sorry, you haven't heard the whole thing because, you know, it's not out, or maybe you've heard the whole thing, I don't know, <laughs> who knows, but um, um, it's very, like, rock-inspired R&B-esque stuff, which is emotive and storytelling and quite dark, um, and that is kind of, as I said, very me, um, as well as, like, the concepts of Beautiful Disaster, it's also a, the kind of way I look at love and I also look at the world in, in a lot of ways, um, like even socio-political ways where I think there's a lot of chaos in the world and a lot of people get down about it, including myself, but I think, I think there's beauty in imperfection. And I think this idea of things being perfect doesn't exist. And I think imperfection is actually perfection, if you know what I mean. It sounds I like do. a tongue twister, but you know what I mean? I think I the fact that things aren't perfect and the fact that things are disasters and you have to work for it and there's chaos and there's imbalance is what makes it beautiful. And the story of the album is about essentially a relationship, which is like that, um, which I think all relationships are. And the conclusion of the album is that we're a disaster. We may be toxic, we may be chaotic, but there's beauty in the struggle and the, this this thing we've built is beautiful regardless of its flaws. And that, would, you, would you say that you, you, because when, when I'm trying to, one thing that I like to do during interviews, I sort of like try to understand um, the viewpoints of the artists, you know what I mean? I feel like this is the best way to relate to them in their art. Do you find beauty in brokenness? Very much so. Um, even, what is that? And I hate to like get get these things wrong, but you know that um, I don't remember if it's Japanese or Chinese, but it's a, I think it's an East Asian tradition of you know when things break, you actually glue it back together. Yes, uh, yes. And it, mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and I think that's super beautiful because I think it's about reconstruction, and I think it's about you know instead of throwing things away and forgetting about them, is working on them, creating something new out of something that was broken. Um, and I think there is a lot of a lot of beauty in things that are flawed because I think ultimately ultimately we are all flawed and the world is completely flawed. Um, but you'd be a fool to to miss all the beauty in it, really. I find that very wise and very special that you're able to express the beauty that the area that there is to find to be found in in, in, in broken things and also in or in, in, well, in damaged things, but also mm -hmm. in the flaw of things. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that reflect a little bit of like who you are? Would you say that you're someone who who embraces his flaws and his brokenness? And because you sound like you you're someone who really loves himself, like you sound like you have self love. <laughs> but the way you you talk about the beauty that you find in this thing, are you did you discover that through embracing sort of the parts of yourself that are equally flawed? Hmm. Kind of. It's a weird one because a lot of a lot of a lot of people see it as this like. You know, there's a, there's, there's, there's a lot about self-love nowadays and, and I think sometimes that can get twisted into ego. And yes. I think a lot of the time people hear my music or hear me talk, me, me hear this lyrics I say, and they're like, oh, you must be super confident in yourself and think that you're like, you know, this and you're great and that. And I'm really like, it's not, it's not about the existence of ego. It's actually about the death of ego completely. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't wake up every morning and be like, yeah, you're the fucking man, like, you're the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the opposite. It's, it's understanding that we are all flawed and I accept the fact that I'm not going to be perfect, but I accept the fact that I am, I am exactly who I am. And, you know, I, like, I've, I've made so many mistakes and I'm always, nowadays anyway, you know, when you're a kid, it's different, but I'm always the first person to say sorry. Anyone will tell you that. If I do something bad, I apologize for it. Like, it's not a, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I just, I get it. And I'm not saying I get it above everyone, but I do wish more people would be able to sometimes see things for how they are, which is imperfect, you know? I, I agree. I, I, yeah. And I think it, there's a certain amount of uh, freedom and uh, and relief that comes from embracing these things because Completely. The, the, burden, the burden of performance is gone. You know, yeah, all you have yeah, to yeah. be is remain authentic and do your best. 
Exactly. exactly. Literally, authenticity is key because no one else couldn't do you better than you. It's impossible. Yeah. impossible. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, now, before we wrap up this interview, um, I do want to ask in, about the, the, the concept of emotional the emotional awareness that your song forces people to embrace or to get into. Um, I find that your music can scare a lot of people who are now ready to face the parts of themselves <laughs> that are, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. That makes sense. <laughs> now, for especially, especially young men, you know, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what would be um, your advice for someone who is not yet ready to look into his, his or her own darkness and brokenness and how how would you exp how would you explain um the 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 thought process that you get into when you to someone who's never experienced it you know what i mean like for for someone who wants to relate to that part of themselves how would you explain what it's like to see things the way you see them and yeah. accept and accept them the way you do yeah 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 it's it's a hard one um, it's really interesting you say that as well because a lot of my fans actually including the boys and the male fans are the type of guys who are actually more emotionally in tune than a lot of other people like a lot of other guys you know because cheers to that thing here probably, exactly <laughs> you could probably say that there are there aren't a lot of guys who are emotionally in tune and to be honest you know Maybe I need to become a philosopher because I don't know the answers, but I would like to find out. Okay. But I, I, I just think that, I think that men specifically and guys, and especially like guys my age and, you know, your age, I'm not sure if you're the same age as me, but you know what I mean? In my 20s, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should, should not be fearful of, of, of being vulnerable because being vulnerable doesn't make you weak. And I think maybe it's about looking at, maybe even looking at emotions, which people always try and say are quote unquote girly, which is obviously the completely wrong and, and sexist thing to say. And just look at them as like being human, you know, and being and knowing that everyone has parts of them which they don't like and everyone has uh, has emotions which they, they're scared to embrace because they're scared of the pain or they're scared of this. But that is exactly who who we are and, and like what makes us who we are. And by going through pain and struggle, you learn about who you are and you become your own more authentic self. Definitely. Um, what was your, what, what would you say was the most challenging part, uh, the most challenging part uh, when it came down to working on Beautiful Disaster? I think the most challenging part for me was not finishing it because a lot of artists say, you know, a lot of people who are perfectionists say that it's really hard to know when to be finished and stuff. And everyone's like, did it, was it really hard? And I was like, no, because for me, yeah, the way I work is that I make so much music, so much different things. And then I start to put things together. And obviously it was hard to choose this final this and final track list and whatever. But when it comes to that part, I kind of leave the, a lot of the creativity behind and get quite strict with it. So when I had 50 songs or whatever I had for the album, I, was, I sat down and I was like, what story am I really trying to tell? And I selected the best songs for the story. I didn't select all the, all my biggest quote unquote hits that I thought I made. Um, and so that for me was actually surprisingly not as challenging. The, the challenge for me is to always push myself to do more creatively. I always want to be able to outdo myself, whether that's like guitarists are better, the lyrics are better, the storytelling is more unique or, or it's more detailed, but it doesn't shy or scare people away. You know, I think that's the main thing. Um, but really, I don't like, I don't, nothing about it really was like, oh, this is really hard for me. And when I say hard, I don't mean like it was all super easy and I made it in a second. It was more like it was a long process and I knew from the beginning it was a long process and it took loads of steps. It would, it took me failing. It took me making songs I didn't like. It took me making three versions of the same song before I knew how that song should sound and all of that, you know, and I, it's kind of similar to the emotional things like, I just embraced it because that part of music and the whole music industry is the part I love. Like I love performing as well, but the social media, like the stunting, all of that, that's not that I make music because I love the process of like writing, making an album, failing, trying again, all of that stuff, you know? So, yeah. 
that's that's dope. I, that was actually <laughs> my next question was what was the favorite yeah. part? Because yeah. again, people, people know people people connect to the to the to the darkest, most uh, you know intimate parts of you, but they they don't know you as the smiley, very joyful person. Exactly. You exactly. know what I mean? What? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But for the people who want to know, like Santino the Saint, like who wants to get to know, like who is he outside of the music? Um, besides music and recording, what's what's the what's your favorite hobby? What's what's something that you do that brings you joy and happiness outside of that? Like, aside from sharing, aside from sharing a drink with me. Yeah, yeah. Aside, <laughs> um, I do like to party though. That is very true. Um, uh, I play basketball like three times a week. Cool. I play for a team, so two teams actually. So that's like my one of my that's my main other other thing outside. Um, I used to play like higher level. And you know, really want to play ball pro, and then music came when I was like, yeah, music is music's the one. First love. Yeah, my basketball, I skate, and I BMX as well. So that, that's the like my like my activities that I do outside of music. Yeah, BMX. That, that that's interesting. That's something I always wanted to get into, but it's just yeah. it comes across as so extreme. I feel like you know you, you gotta you gotta you gotta really love danger too. You know what I mean? <laughs> Bro, yep, I love anything that makes me feel alive. That's it. Anything that like there's a risk factor or there's some type of something in it, that's all me. That's all me. That's what's up. Well, then, last question um, for, for for what would you like uh, to share to people? What would you like to share um, to people who are wondering? Hmm, beautiful disaster. Should I get into that on November 19th? Like, what, <laughs> what, yeah, what would yeah, you like yeah, them yeah. to know about their project and why you think they might connect with it? If if I'm talking to the people right now. <laughs> if you if you're if you're bored of hearing um, playlist generated music that sounds all the same and that fits into genres that don't emotionally connect with you you need to listen to the album because it's a true raw authentic story piece mixed with mixed of rock and r&b and hip-hop and all of these other genres in a way which is emotive and that anyone can relate to and understand and it will speak to those dark emotions that whether you're ready to talk about them or feel them or whatever you'll be able to to experience them and express them in a way which is almost a safe space you and your headphones that's it um yeah and i think if some if you're if you're ever bored of music you need to listen to that you need to listen to my all my stuff really really but yeah i i, I want to wholeheartedly agree with you uh like i said i've had the pleasure of discovering your music fairly recently um yeah. and um i want to applaud you for your artistry first of all um thank you, you know it, your, your your self-awareness your, your courage to go where a lot of people are not not only willing to go but um you know like making it safe for them to go there with you you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I really applaud it. I'm 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 uh, I'm a fan, and I'm really looking forward uh, to the album. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. once again, I'm sure our fans are gonna love it as well. Uh, it's gonna be so. available. Was that sorry? I hope so. <laughs> oh no, I, I I know so. I know so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the people who want to follow you, Santino the Saint on Instagram, social media platform, everywhere. everywhere, and available on all stream platform again, November 19. Do I have that correct? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Well, I'm really excited about it. Santino, again, my name is Don IT. It was a pleasure uh, to have to talk with you today. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, bro. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, like.